Welcome to Season 4 of Public Health On Call, a podcast from the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I'm Josh Sharfstein, Vice Dean for Public Health Practice and Community Engagement and a former Commissioner of Health in Baltimore City. Our goal is to bring scientific evidence and experience to current topics in public health through engaging interviews with scientists, community leaders, policy experts, public health officials, clinicians, and more. If you have ideas or questions for us to cover, please email us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. That's publichealthquestion at jhu.edu for future podcast episodes. Hi, listeners. I'm Lindsay Smith-Rogers, producer of Public Health On Call. Since March 3rd, 2020, Public Health On Call has brought you more than 400 episodes with evidence and experts to help unpack the day's COVID-19 and public health news and what it means for tomorrow. As we wind down season four, we have a few thank yous. First, a big thank you to our interns, Kelly Corcoran, Caroline Wang, Alyssa Tsu, and Hannah Bennett, who bring fresh ideas and much needed support for the podcast. We'd also like to thank you, our listeners, for sharing your ideas and questions and for downloading this podcast more than six million times. We're taking a break starting December 23rd, and we'll be back on January 3rd with season five of Public Health On Call. We'll continue to cover the latest on COVID vaccines, treatment breakthroughs, and research. We'll talk about living with COVID and what our world might look like going forward as we move from pandemic crisis to endemic virus. We'll also cover other urgent public health issues, including racism, gun violence, mental health, climate change, and overdose. We so appreciate all the great ideas that come from our listeners. So please keep writing us at publichealthquestion at jhu.edu. And thank you for being part of this podcast. Today, I speak to Reverend Dr. Terrace King, pastor of the Liberty Grace Church of God in Baltimore City for the last 30 years. Our topic is the work he has done throughout the pandemic to build understanding and trust in COVID-19 vaccines, and the lessons of this work for partnerships between healthcare and faith communities in the future. Let's listen. Reverend Dr. Terrace King, thank you so much for joining me on Public Health On Call. Now, we've been talking about the COVID pandemic and about vaccination for a long while now. I remember at the beginning, you know, as the vaccines were coming out, both of us were wondering about how many people would take them. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. That's right. And let's walk through, you know, how you've approached this. When, with those early days, what were you thinking? So in the early days, there was fear. Uh, fear that far exceeded what does now. There was the unknown. There was the unknown uh, as I was really promoting flu vaccine. My thinking was, let's get folks as healthy as we could. So in working with IVAP, I was really pushing flu. And while I was doing that simultaneously, people were already starting to ask questions before vaccines existed as to what COVID vaccines could be about and how their fears and concerns really pushed back on anything related to a vaccine. So fear was at an all-time high. So we're talking about really the very beginning of the pandemic. Yes. When there was no vaccine available, you were working with the International Vaccine Access Center at Johns Hopkins, what you called IVAC, just to help people get vaccinated against flu if they still needed flu vaccine. That's right. That's right. And even then, people were maybe hesitant about that vaccine and fearful of other vaccines. But they were not only hesitant about that vaccine, but one of their concerns was that we were slipping in uh, a COVID vaccine into the flu vaccine. So misinformation really heightened during that period of fear. So the push that we successfully made around the flu vaccine was even harder because COVID was looming in the background. Wow. 
that that's really that's really amazing. I mean, this is before people even knew there would be a COVID vaccine. There was already misinformation about a COVID vaccine. Absolutely. Absolutely. Okay, so let's fast forward a little bit. The research is now going on. We're starting to hear about studies showing that the vaccine uh, is safe and effective. At this point, what what are you hearing either in your church or in your community? What, what are you thinking about the vaccine? I know that you were asking a lot of questions then too. So we have to fast forward, but at the same time, take into context that my church and many in my immediate community went through a process that many others have not had the advantage of. What I did was to bring into my virtual congregation, Johns Hopkins, Sanofi, and Pfizer. So what I did was to put science in the proper pecking order for my congregation and community so that they could be informed without fear that they could understand this was still the church running it. This was prayer service. We're praying for these scientists, but we're getting information from the scientists. And we walk through that process related to the flu. And we also ask these companies detailed questions while the vaccine was being formed. So my people are in a different place because they feel that they have been informed all the way through the process with complete transparency and they've had access. So let me know more about what one of those sessions was like. It was, you said during an actual church service? So yes, it was a prayer service. So most churches, African-American churches have Sunday service, of course, but they have Bible study and prayer service, Wednesday night. So on a Wednesday night, picture this. I'm running it like I normally do any prayer service. And we invite these two pharmaceutical companies in, and we invite a vaccine specialist, scientist, doctor from Hopkins in. He walks through the flu process, walks through the vaccine, talks about it, and then we're open for questions. And the fears and concerns and the hesitation of the congregation was put on the table with me moderating the event and keeping the event respectful. So those early meetings like that, what were the kinds of questions that were coming up? The questions really had to do with both historical, people needed to get it off their chest. I'm afraid because of historical reasons, but it wasn't just that. I'm afraid because of current unequal treatment. Is it true that the COVID vaccine will include uh, COVID itself? How do we know what the reaction will be long term? If this is warp speed, how do we know that something hasn't been missed in the process? What should I ask my doctor? These are the health issues that I have. Will COVID vaccine make my current epidemic disease exacerbated by a COVID vaccine because many of the people you're talking to had high and have hypertension, diabetes, down the list. So with those concerns, those were the list of questions. That's some very, very important questions. So you're getting those questions aired very early. Let's fast forward now to the fall of 2020 as some of those results are coming in. What, what, what's the discussion then? There was still some hesitancy as results were coming in of now it's who do we trust? Because there's misinformation and there's facts. And the decision point while I was holding those meetings, I was simultaneously a part of a national group, Robert Wood Johnson, with Johns Hopkins. We were holding sessions all across the country, Latinx groups, indigenous and African-Americans. The African-American group was split into two cohorts, one having to do with an academic group at Xavier and then me representing the black church. So I had five or six congregations 
weekly and bi-weekly on calls and listening sessions, listening to their concerns, but also educating them as it relates to the COVID vaccine and the virus. And what were those discussions like? Were they similar to the ones before? Were they different? They were really more detailed. And we saw the transition of people. It showed you that the process of building trust takes time. It demonstrated that if these people are heard and respected, these people, my people, myself, are respected and heard. And if their concerns are put on the table and addressed, not in a paternal way, and that's a key piece. It's not that we have to educate them, that many times these people are educated. And we walk through a process that says, okay, these are the facts as we know them today. And these are the adjustments that had to be made in this process as we went along. Mask, no mask. So whenever there were adjustments, we talked them out. And those discussions caused people who were definitely opposed to getting the vaccine to changing their minds. Could you talk for a bit about how you shared your own decision-making process around the vaccine with your congregation or other congregations? So in the very beginning, regardless, I was not going to be committed to taking the vaccine because I needed to be, in my mind, a neutral arbitrator who stood on the bridge between science and the sanctuary. I needed to be able to say, we are assessing science. Even though I'm a scientist with minority health, we're going to look at this issue anew. And I'm my responsibility as a, as a trusted source is to hold those entities accountable. So I'm representing community and congregation, your interests. Even though I'm working with the health department and Hopkins, I'm representing your, representing your interests first. That's what really caused, even in conversation, people talked about trust. People talked about my role. And so I stayed neutral until to me, I had seen enough shots take place where I could say my own anxiety has diminished. And another key piece that occurred, I must say, is it hit me personally. Everyone in my immediate family except myself got COVID. And my congregation knew it. And the community knew it. And so the fact that I had been spared, I said, well, look, you know, I'm going to get this vaccine. There's enough information for me now. But you still have the right to ask the questions that you're asking. In fact, if you didn't have distress for the healthcare system, I would say you're insane at this point. I mean, that's what I literally was saying from my pulpit. You have to critique and hold the system accountable. So in a way, you took your congregation on your own journey. You shared what you were thinking at each step, including, you know, when the switch flipped for you and you were ready to be vaccinated, you explained why in a way that respected their ability to make their own decision. And then I took them on Sunday morning service into the hospital. I had leaders of my church sick with COVID who had their phones in their rooms. They could see what was going on. They could hear and witness the suffering. It wasn't a scare tactic. It was reality. This is what we're dealing with. And here's how as a community, we must protect ourselves for the culture. And that's the part of this that many African-Americans and communities have lost. Those who are still hesitant are saying they're doing this for the culture, that they're protecting the rights and the respect of African-Americans. In my congregation and community, we took that back. We said it's for the culture, not just for ourselves, but for our community 
that we must take this shot to protect ourselves. Talk to your doctors, but we must because the system that we distrust will let us die. And that's the belief we went into this with. And it has left me with respectability and trust as a leader in terms of how I was able to navigate this. I never call my anti-vacciners out and I still don't. And at the same time, have you seen a gradual shift oh, yeah. in your congregation oh, yeah. similar to the shift that you made? Oh yeah, it's been more than a gradual shift. We are the only West Baltimore church that serves as a semi-permanent vaccine site. We got a grant from Open Society for that purpose. So every month we're giving all the vaccines. But the mo- one of the most important things that I've done in this shift, and I must say, is the African-American community was suffering from an epidemic before we were hit by the pandemic. So issues like diabetes were at epidemic proportions before COVID came along. And what I promised is that I was coming back Because one of the major concerns for many people of color was the only reason you're doing this, promoting the COVID vaccine, is because our disease for once affects whites. And I addressed that issue. And I promise to come back and do all I can as an advocate to have issues like diabetes prevention and cancer specifically breast cancer, screening and prevention promoted in our communities along with other issues because they were right. What do you think the lessons of your experience and your church's experience in COVID are more broadly for the healthcare system? I think that what has been done in certain places like Memphis, where I'm on a plane to next week, where church has integrated initiatives in Memphis and in North Carolina with hospital systems like Hopkins. We are not willing to go back as religious leaders in Baltimore City. I've held over 75 pop-ups for Baltimore City Self-Department, over close to three churches involved. We're not willing to go back to our normal process where we simply had church and we were not involved in health care. There should be a process put in place. And Hopkins is the ideal partner as an international vehicle to integrate the preventive care work and the navigators and community health workers that can really be pushed from the church into reducing cost while maintaining or increasing the quality of care with an entity like Hopkins. That's what needs to happen. Real partnership, not isolated, not where Hopkins develops its plan in isolation, but working together to do what the federal government wants us to do. You cannot access people of color without the trusted source. You cannot deal with chronic disease Hopkins without dealing with these partners. Let's come together, build a plan as to how we will reduce health disparities, increase health equity, and address social determinants in Baltimore. And because Hopkins is here, make it a model for the country and the world. That's what needs to take place. Well, it sounds like uh, you've taken a big step forward with a whole bunch of partners during COVID, and there's a critical next step to take. Absolutely. Thank you so much for this opportunity. Reverend Dr. King, thank you so much for joining me today on Public Health On Call. Public Health On Call is produced by Josh Sharfstein, Lindsay Smith-Rogers, and Stephanie Desmond. Audio production by Spencer Greer, Niall Owen McCusker, and Matthew Martin with support from Chip Hickey. Distribution by Nick Moran. Production support from Catherine Ricardo, Social media support from Grace Holes Fernandez and Caroline Wong. Thank you for listening.